Howdy, everybody. My name is Garrett Serac. I am a uh, software developer on the Azure Development Experience team. That's what it is, yes. <laughs> uh, and today I'm going to talk about generating uh, Azure PowerShell commandlets and more, and other kinds of commandlets. You can generate any kind of commandlets you want, any kind, uh, via AutoRest. Uh, and we're going to talk about the community and things that we're doing here. So, well, let's start at the beginning. So, we're going to talk a little bit about what Open API is in Swagger. I'll try to make it brief, but I don't want to shoo anybody away if they're not, you know, heavily familiar with this stuff. So we'll go over that quickly. Uh, and then we're going to talk about auto rest and where you get it from. And we can generate some commandlets and figure out how to customize some stuff. And then we're going to do a little bit of a detour and talk about some stuff about Azure, the stuff we're doing in the Azure community or Azure PowerShell uh, commandlets because it's very important. Okay, so. Open API. Open API is a format for basically documenting a wire, uh, the wire protocol of REST services. Um, that's its primary and really only goal there is just to be able to say this is exactly what you should see over the wire. Here's the, here's the, here's the request. Here's the response. Uh, and come up with this thing. Uh, it used to be called, so version two of this was called Swagger. It is a trademark of, uh, I don't remember the name of that company anymore. <laughs> uh, it is a trademark thing, so when they made it a standardized standard in the Linux Foundation, they called it Open API. Uh, so we like to say Open API, and if you find people from the Open API board, they will smack you every time you say the word Swagger. So it's always good, always good to start that way. Um, and you can actually express this in both YAML and JSON. I know there's a big uh, opinion about one or the other for a lot of people, so that's kind of weird. <laughs> anyway. So here's an example of what an, uh, an open API uh, document looks like. This is actually in the 2.0 format. It's called Swagger. There was changes between 2.0 and 3.0, but basically AutoRest will allow you to use either one of them, um, which is a good thing. And so in here, you'd be able to be able to describe, you know, basically things like the host and where this is coming from. Um, you can describe the, what the what the API does, and then what it produces and consumes. So in this particular case, application JSON, which is obviously what most people's open API stuff does. And then you get to describe the operations, and it starts off with paths, and it says, oh, on this path, here's what a get looks like, and here is what, uh, here's an operation, and we you know, give it some things like descriptions and what the responses can be, and you're supposed to document all the different kinds of responses that you're going to see. Um, and so in this particular case, I've got, uh, there's a web service out there for getting the comic, for an XKCD comic, and so they've got two endpoints there, and, and basically you can get today's comic, or you can get the, the one for... Uh, one for a particular day or, or, or index. Uh, and then you can, when you're returning objects, you can say, here's the schema for these things. And so this uses JSON schema to describe what those objects should look like on the wire. Uh, and we use that kind of information to generate some classes when we're actually trying to build some, some things for, for AutoRest. So what is AutoRest? Well, AutoRest is a, it takes an open API specification and it'll generate an SDK. In Azure, We've been using this to generate all of the consumer SDKs for all of the web, all the Azure services or the management SDKs for all the uh, Azure services. We've got about 94, 95 services mm -hmm. that we generate SDKs for. And we do this across a lot of languages. So C Sharp, Java, Python, Ruby, Go, TypeScript. I want to say there's another one, but I can't remember what it is. Um, the idea there is, is that because the wire protocol is described so well, and that the, so the, you know, the, the resource provider and, you know, say, uh, compute will say, here's what all these endpoints look like. Uh, we can then turn around and generate documentation from that. We generate SDKs from that. And now we want to be able to generate actual autorest or uh, actual PowerShell commands uh, in the form of modules. And previously, so if you've used Azure at all, and you've used the commandlets to manage resources in Azure, every one of those commandlets up till now is basically um, actually, they use the SDK that we generated, the C Sharp SDK, but then they've handwritten every commandlet in there. And the, usually it's the product group that's actually done that work, and they spend an awful lot of time writing these things. And they're not PowerShell experts. These guys write, you know, storage code, or the guys are writing, you know, uh, a lot of these things. PowerShell is not their, their primary responsibility, so the fact they had to divert somebody, go and build this thing, and then... And even then, we have to go and look at it and go, geez, this command really sucks, guys. So we try to, we want to get this so that we can improve the quality of these things and whatnot. And we also want to make it so that it's consistent and we get things out that we're expecting. Uh, and, and from both our perspective of maintaining this, that's huge. But from your perspective of using it, oh my God, you don't want to have to learn the weirdness of each, of each individual RP. 
So Autorest is going to help us do that. So what do you need? Uh, so Autorest is built mostly, partially, somewhat on Node.js. Um, so you need to install Node.js 10 right now. Do not install anything later because it won't work. Don't install anything earlier because that won't work either. Um, <laughs> uh, the reason we're focusing on the LTS version is because the uh, when they change things in Node, they will go through a long period of, of instability, and, and trust me, it, it just doesn't work. Anyway, so installing is really easy. You can use the Node package manager, so npm install dash g. And at this point in time, if you want to do PowerShell, which anybody PowerShell fan here? Yeah, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> use the Autorest at beta, which <clears throat> brings, it brings down the beta version, which allows you to use PowerShell because the, the stable version does not yet support that. And if you don't have .NET Core, uh, 2.1 or greater or whatnot. I've actually created a set of NPM packages that'll install that. Don't tell any of the .NET guys if they're in here. That, that doesn't exist. And the same thing with uh, PowerShell Core. If for some strange reason you didn't have it and you wanted to be able to install it, I, 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 there's an NPM package for that as well. Not that that's the official way and it's okay. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> but it's there. Um, here we go. Okay, so let's start with a very simple example, that XKCD. Um, document that I showed you earlier. We can actually just turn around and generate that. Oh, and I'm going to do this right this time. I hit the escape button first. And there we go. Switch to this. Big font. Everybody likes a big font. Um, so I've got this, uh, I got the YAML document here. And so I'm just going to run auto rest. And I just say dash dash PowerShell. And then I'm going to say input file is xkcd.m. So I'll run that. And so what will happen here is that Autorest will, um, if you don't have the PowerShell plugin installed already, it'll go and grab it all on the fly and use it. Right now I've already used it many times, so it's got it down here. And so then it's going to do, and bam, 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 done. So it took that tiny little document and it generated me a, uh, a folder with everything in it. So let's go take a look and see what we got at the other end. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to um, okay, hopefully you can see this well. Oh yeah, it looks okay. Good. So what we ended up with is a generated folder, and we actually built a whole bunch of stuff. Let me just show you from the command line first here, generated. So it, it created us a, a whole subsystem of crap in here, uh, including some uh, PowerShell scripts to basically build and generate, or build and, and package up the module. And so these are the exact same steps that we're going to follow through, or follow when we actually do the, the, uh, the new AZ commandlets that we're building. Anyway, so if we take a quick gander in there, actually, let's, first thing we're going to do is we're going to just uh, uh, generated. I'm going to build this module. And so what this does, um, we do this in two stages. We take and we generate all these these commandlets out first, and then we'll take that and we'll we have a build script that automatically build uh, that will build that and put it all together and uh, and prepare it for use. And so if I want to actually test it, I'm just going to go and say run module and hit enter. And so what that's going to do, it's going to load the module up right now and put me in an isolated session so I can play with it. And if I want to then exit and then do some more tweaking or whatever I can. So so let's go get XKCD comic. Let's just see what happens. Boop, done. So it went off, made a rest call, brought back that, the, the response for that and produced it as an object. Now what's really nice about this is that we actually have uh, a default format being generated for the type that we got back. Um, so if I pipe that to there, you can see everything that came back in that. I have uh, a variant of that because I had two, you know how I had two endpoints, one was called get XA, KCD comic and one was, um, one took a day and one didn't, so then I can just say uh, comic ID and I can go 323, something like that. Oops, there we go. So now I got, I got back the object and it's got the transcript and the title and stuff like that, so this is great. So now I've been able to go off and grab a, uh, and, and grab something. So this is a very, very simple command. Obviously, it's a very simple thing. What was really nice is that I ended up with two parameter sets for the same command. Load. I didn't end up with two commandlets just because there was two endpoints. Uh, Autorest looks at all of this and goes, geez, those, those things look like they could be the same thing. And we're going to take a look and see how that actually works. So what we generated, any, 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 so inside the generated folder, we actually have a generated folder, which uh, inside here I generated a, uh, boy, it doesn't fit much on the screen, does it? I generated a, a, a low-level API for this. So this is what's used internally by the commandlets that got generated, and it will have a method for every single 
Can you see that in the back? Can I shrink it down a little so I can show more on the screen? Let me go down about there. Is that okay? Awesome. Sorry? Okay. So basically, we generated out an API for an internal API for every single possible endpoint, and it has all of the whatever parameters it took and stuff like that. And over the course of the years about working on all rest, I came to the realization that the best thing to do was to build a specific method that just did exactly what it needed to and didn't have an, ex you know, an excess of runtime libraries or things like that. So what you see here, all the code that was needed for this set of commandments to build is in this folder. There are no libraries or DLLs that we drag along, no packages to install from anywhere. This thing doesn't even require uh, an additional JSON parser or anything like that because we bring along our own. Um, and it's very small. So this thing, so the actual thing here, it basically creates the URL, it puts the parameters in, uh, and it makes a call. And the call is pretty simple too. Where did it go? There it is. And so it makes a call and comes back, blah, blah, blah. So you don't care how much that, how that actually works. What you really care about is a commandlet. Oh, and then all of the models that come back, for all the things that come back from the, that are used both as uh, parameters or bodies and coming back as response bodies, we ended up generating a model class for. Um, and because of the complexities of way that you can express things in, in OpenAPI, we actually generate uh, interfaces for these things. And this looks all complicated, but trust me, you don't even have to worry about how it works. But you'll get back an interface that basically has all the things that, has, that it comes with. So these are all the things that should be in, in the body when it comes back. Uh, and then we have an internal version of that same thing for very complex scenarios. Okay, let me go find the commandlets. Dun, dun, dun. Commandlets. So in here, this thing actually generated three, co three commandlets when it, did, when it did the work. So the first two, it did this one here, which is the... the get XKC, XKCD comic for today. So it said, oh, I've got this operation. Here's what it looks like. Um, I'm going to guess the name of this thing is going to be get XKCD comic. And then it's got an underscore and it says get, um, which is the, basically the, it's a good way to put this, the, the variant or the parameter set that we're looking at, right? So we actually ended up with a couple of different, vari uh, three different parameter sets for the same commandlet. And we actually split them into three different commandlets because during development, you might want to say turn one off or you might want to do some modifications or something like that. And generating one ginormous C-sharp commandlet makes people go crazy, uh, starting with myself. So each one of these only, only handles one particular um, uh, scenario at a time, which makes it really easy to debug. It makes it really easy to maintain. It's very clear. There's, not, there's no branching in any of these, no crazy branching. Um, anyway, so then we've got one here, and this one here takes, uh, is, is another variant of the same thing. And it takes a, uh, what was it, a parameter, an ID or something like that, a comic ID. And then we generated another one because this thing looks like a resource and it looks like it matches a certain pattern. And so if you get, if you do a get XKC to comic, you should be able to pipe that back in and then basically call it itself again. In this particular case, not a lot of use, but this is really useful in Azure where it's like if you want to get a resource and then you want to pipe that to some other command that takes a resource, we automatically generate those things so that they can handle piping scenarios for one thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing. So you can do a get, you can do a new a, to a get to a to a delete all in one line if you want to do a bit. Hey, um, sure. And so we've got many variants. And so what ended up happening after that is we ran a script that we ran that that build command line. And in addition to actually compiling up the C sharp, which none of you want to actually look at anyway, it turns around and it generates an export. So we generate a proxy commandlet that sits in front of all of the private commandlets in behind. So this is what the user experiences when they go to use it, is they get one get XKCD comic with multiple parameter sets. Um, and the reason we did it this way is because we can also pause and say, oh, if you want to go and manually write another, another variant of the same commandlet, let's say you want a get XKCD comic that does something else at the same time or whatever, you can write one vari variant of that which is pretty cool. And we'll come back to the, 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 what it takes to do customizations in a bit. But in here, you'll see that this is basically a, a fairly straightforward proxy commandlet. It basically figures out which one it needs to call, and then it calls that one in the behind, and, and bang, it works. Yay! Um, so let's just make sure. So if I did this, and then I said I want to do, let's get the IMG and then invoke, what is that, invoke? IWL. I read the quest. Yada, 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 out file, foo dot, I want to say it's a PNG, PNG. Yeah. and then we can just go, foo PNG, should open that up, come on, there it is, <laughs> bang, <laughs> woohoo, yes? All the objects that are 
being returned by the module? Are they of, of the same type of string? Are all the types of objects being returned by the module? They, they are the types that they're specifi specified in the open API file. So in this particular case, the if I do this thing here, if I, yeah. So in here, the num, the, the index number and the month these are, and the day, these are actual ints or ints or floats or whatever they are in the original specification, and that's what you get them back as. Um, you know, even more to the point, you can get, because the, the, the generated commandlet is very well behaved, you can go dot, and then you can, you get all of the type, of, type, type information for all that because it command knows what it returns. Very handy stuff too. Um, and so, yeah, oh, I want the title for that. Boom, qualifiers. It's a strange name. What? Okay, bug number one. Yep. Why does that, where did the word qualifiers come from? That is strange. Okay, well, <laughs> it's, uh, it's not real software unless you can see the shells. Alrighty, so having proved that that actually all works and goes off to a live service, let's jump back to our... And the answer is, yay! Yeah. Ah, dog! Okay, commandlet design. So, some of the things that, that this does in here is these commandlets, so when we build these things, um, the commandlets that get built, the binary that gets built and spit up the other side, these things work on Windows, Linux, and Mac. Same binary, no need to recompile, no need to have multiple anything weird going on. Same thing works everywhere. It works on, uh, on desktop PowerShell and uh, PowerShell Core, just great. They're, they've got a very simple and straightforward layout. You don't have any unnecessary inheritance. So the classes that I generate there all inherit from PS commandlet. They don't have any special base class. I don't know if you've ever looked at the stuff inside of um, inside the existing auto, uh, uh, Azure PowerShell commandlets, but they got an inheritance chain longer than I do. I mean, oh my, they, it's like this inheritance from this and this and this, and if you're trying to find some behavior, you gotta go dig for it. We don't need any of that. It actually turns out really easy. They don't have any additional runtime or dependencies that isn't included. So while we do have a JSON parser in there, it's, it's tiny. It's not very big at all. It's certainly not um, Newton soft size. Uh, extensibility points everywhere. So every single part of this thing has an extensibility point. All the, all, the, all the classes are partial classes, so you can go ahead and add in some more behavior all you want. The, the serialization has extensibility methods, so if you've got a very special data type that you said, well, I want to handle this a little bit differently than this thing or the other thing, uh, you can go and just implement one function in a partial class to say, I want to handle serialization, or I want to add a thing to serialization, or I want to change something. You have uh, insane amounts of complete control. In addition to that, we allow you to write a custom variant for these things, so I can write another commandlet, so if I want to say, uh, say I'm generating the, 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 the module for compute, and create VM. Now there are about, I don't know, 30 variants or 30 <laughs> million things you have to pass to create VM, but 99% of the time, all you really want is you know, a very simple commandlet. So you want, to, you want to build something that's a scenario. So you want to have defaults, you want to change the way something happens. So you can do that. You can just write a copy of that commandlet. And each one of those, and that copy, and that commandlet, you can write it in C Sharp or, or, uh, or in just regular PowerShell script, which is actually what we want to do in Azure, is just write our additional things in, in PowerShell. So there might be three or four variants of get, C, uh, get XKCD comic. Mm -hmm. And we could go in and write one more and write it in PowerShell. And then when we run that run mo or build module command, it will go and build the proxy. It'll look and go, oh, that one and that one and that one and that one. And it doesn't matter if they're scripts or, or uh, native or C sharp, which, you know, from our perspective is actually a game changer because this will lower the amount of effort it takes us to manage and build uh, commandlets for a very large API surface. Yes. Mm -hmm. So he's asking about the dependencies um, between different modules in Azure. If you've got, you know, for example, we've got uh, storage. Storage gets used by a lot of different things. And so if you've got, you know, if you've got a module for Redis cache or I don't know what, and, and, and it needs to go and use something from storage, currently what we ended up doing is, is that they will, 
there will be this unspoken dependency between these two modules, and it'll call across, or they'll do something else weird. So what we do in this particular case is we'll actually go and grab the open API files for the things we need from the other, other RP, and we'll just use them directly and just generate the APIs for the other resource that we need right away. Um, one of the other things that's in here, and let me go and, I'm gonna go and show you this now because this is kind of a cool little thing too. So in the models class, API, Models. So we've got this comic. So there's my, there's my definition of my comic. So the other things they actually generate in here is I have the class that has the serialization in here, or the part of the class. This is a partial class that has the serialization. And so it turns out, by the way, that, that this is far less code to generate and execute than doing something like Newton soft JSON, which has to do reflection at runtime in order to figure out how to do serialization. This is so fast, it's not even funny. Um, but more to the point, then we add some stuff for specifically for PowerShell. While this builds on a C sharp, low level C sharp library that we, we use, um, we also have the ability to, to uh, introduce type converters for every type. So if you've got a type here, so any type that we get generated here, you can take a, an arbitrary dictionary and say, cast it to that thing, and it will populate that object for you. Um, and it can be as complicated and crazy as you want, and it'll just recursively go through and populate that from a recursive dictionary all you want. Very cool stuff. Uh, and we do the same thing for, P we, can, we can cast anything from a PS object to any other thing like that as well. And the third thing we do in this particular case is that if you have two modules that have something that has, that, that references something that should be the same type, I don't want to create a binary dependency between these, but if something spits out a, you know, Joe resource on this side, and something over here wants to take a Joe resource, and they've both got their own definition of that, uh, if they're both generated with autorest here, it'll actually, it'll, the, the type converter will allow you to take that one and turn it into one of these like that. Um, and so that makes it really, really easy to share things between different resource providers without having to make physical, hard-coded um, dependencies between these because the type conversion is just transparent and supported by every single object in our, uh, in our environment. Uh, and so we've got a custom type converter written for every single type that handles all of this behavior. And it turns out it works really good, too. And it's fast. Anyway, back, back to the show. Oh, I did it again. <laughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's next? So customizations. So let's talk a bit about what we can do with customizations. So we have a lot of different layers, right? There's a lot of levers we can pull one of which is tweaking the generation process. So the way that we figure out what the commandlet name should be is we take a look at the operation in that, in that open API document, and I look, for, I look for the operation ID, and then I tear that apart and I say, what, I'm looking for an English verb in there. So usually get, list, whatever. I actually have a list of 6,500 English verbs in, inside the code here that it will try to match for and figure out what is the actual verb that you've said. And then based on that and the position of it, we try to figure out, well, what is the, what is the act or what is the uh, subject or noun that we're going to be looking for? And then we map that stuff to something. So if your operation is called, uh, you know, um, list children or list, list whatever, it will go through and it'll say, oh, that list, well, we should map list to get. So we found the get and then it'll figure out children. Well, what we try to do is also um, normalize out names so that we're not using plurals and things like that. So children would be become child. And we literally have a huge class in there that deals with just pluralization and singularization so that we can take words like that and turn it into the root word that it is. And even if that's not good and we come up with some weird name for stuff like that, in the case of uh, if it can't figure out what to do with that verb, it'll go, huh, invoke, <laughs> which is the catch-all for everything, right? So in the event that that happens, you can actually go in and, and provide it a little bit of configuration information that says, hey, you really should just change the name to this. And there's some regular expression matching and stuff like that, so if you've got a whole lot of things that you can come up with a couple of patterns for, you can do this in just a few lines of, of text. And then on top of that, you can build the custom commandlet variants um, for, for adding different par parameter sets, and we already talked about that a bit. Uh, and then on top of all that, we have module level customizations you can make. So it generates a module.cs class somewhere in there, and it's a partial class too, so you can go ahead and add some more code and the great part is all these customizations you're doing, you can just go dump them into the custom folder 
uh, and they're partial classes with whatever if you're doing the C-sharp stuff. And you can just keep, keep regenerating. You can change things, regenerate, change things, regenerate constantly, and it won't overwrite those other changes you're making. Um, so then on the module level of customizations, let's say you want to implement your own authentication or, or you want to be able to add extra headers or logging or whatever it is you want to do. I don't even care. You can go in, add a couple of methods, and add something to track for every single request. You can do whatever you want. Modify the request before it goes across the wire. Modify the request after it comes back, or the response before it, you know, when it comes back from across the wire. You have full and total control on what ends up getting implemented. Um, and then authentication, you can put in whatever you want. Uh, the only authentication we, we, we support built in is basically for the Azure ARM service because everything is always different. But I've got a couple examples out there that show how to add whatever you want to that sort of thing. And it's pretty darn easy, actually. And a lot of other advanced customization points. When I mean advanced, there's a lot of little levers we can pull and change. I don't want to go into too much detail here. So, customization example. Oh, I was going to show you something like that. I had forgot about that. Um, we talked about most of it already. Uh, what's our time look like? Uh, oh, we're 25 yeah. minutes in. I got a couple minutes here. Let's. So I've got one of these that I did for. Sorry. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, it's okay. I didn't show anything yet. Oh, come on. I missed. No. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. Come on, there we go. All okay. right. Let me get out of that. My little thing there was telling me I still had my XKCD uh, module loaded. That's probably not where I want to go. All right, let me get out of here, and then one of the times where. I'm. So uh, let's go take a quick gander in here. So I have got the New York Times has an API wire service you can go ahead and use. And so they've defined their YAML. I took this off the web from somebody somewhere, and it was pretty, you know, it's, this is still a small one. We have Azure ones that are like, you know, tens of thousands of lines long, so 260 lines ain't going to hurt nobody. Um, basically, though, this allows you to get a bunch of articles out from, from uh, their web service. And so I've generated it here, and I tossed some code into the custom folder. And so in this particular case, I wanted to be able to add in a authentication header on each thing, and I wanted to pick it up from an environment variable because I'm too lazy to do anything else about that. Um, and so in my, uh, in, my, in my partial class for module, I just basically told it I want to do some custom init stuff, and I told it uh, add, a, add a step to the pipeline. So we have this, this pipeline of things that can happen when you go to make a request, and you can stick something in at the beginning or the end of the pipeline, which makes it really easy to configure exactly what you're looking to have it do. Uh, and there are two copies of the pipeline, one for with a proxy and one without. Anybody want to guess why I had to do that? Because the because the web request class or the web request uh, class does not allow you to change the, loca the, the 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 location of a proxy once you've created the instance or the uh, once you've instantiated it. So I had to have two of these anyway. Uh, so in this particular case, I just want to add this one step to the uh, end of the uh, pipeline, and I said I want to change. Uh, I want to add uh, an API key. And all I did there is I, I, look, I, I grab the URL that I got, add in the API key, and I pick it up from the environment, and then I say, let it go. Well, I write it out to the command line. That's useful. Anyway, and then I just send it on its way, and I just do a next.send async, and away it goes. So no, not very complicated, really easy to add this in there, and it works pretty good. So then I can go back over here. I'm just going to generate it, and let's go run module. Um, and the other thing you can do is you can, um, if you tell it run module and you go dash code on here, what it'll do is it will, uh -huh, what did I do? Oh, that's fine. All right. All right, everybody. So again, run module will create the instance of the, uh, of the command or the, it'll create another copy of, of PowerShell and load the module into it for you. So then now I can actually play with it and you can see that by the change in my prompt. When I go dash code, what it's going to do is it opens up a copy of VS Code and it drops in a launch.json file so that if I want to go and say debug something in here now, so what do I got, get article? Get article, right. So I'm going to run get article and I'm going to say source is NYT and section is sports. So I can just run that and away it goes, boom. I got back my list and this particular thing returns a results, I think. Boom. So now I got, uh, look at that. I got a bunch of these result objects back. 
Eh, it's great and all, you know, it works really fine and everything. And apparently my authentication worked because it didn't yell at me. But let's say I wanted to go ahead and debug that. So let's go, I'm going to go get article, blah, 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 and I'm just going to go break. So now it sits here and goes, oh, waiting for the debugger to attach. Because I wrote that launch JSON file, all you have to do is switch back to VS Code, hit F5, and it'll launch, it'll, it'll attach. Oh, 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 what did I do? What? <sighs> now what? Oh, am I running in the... I bet you this is my elevated currency. <sighs> Bad developer, no cookie. <laughs> Somebody wanted me to show them the uh, the, the, the thing to elevated. Time's right out. Generated run module code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now we can go. Get article, blah, 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 dash break. Oh. All right, sorry, everybody. Oh. No. Uh, I made the window too big. The, uh, I can't grab by the title bar because the thing is on there. Oh, well, we're going to do this. You already had the break. Hang on. There we go. All right, break. So now it says waiting to attach. Now, you'll notice because I used that run module, it updated the launch JSON, changed the process ID. And so now I go back here and it should just, there we go. It just attaches. And so now, boom, I'm broken to the middle of my commandlet. I can just F10 over a bunch of these things. We're going to go through the implementation of this. And I ran through it and it probably exited by now. It did. Let's do that again. Let's go bang, bang, bang. So let's find the process record async. So there's the implementation of where it's going to actually make the call. So blah, 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 it's going to do this. Let's stop it just before it goes ahead and, and makes the call. So now it's about to go into the articles list by source, which is the actual name of the operation ID in the original open API document. But trust me, this makes debugging these things really great. If you're trying to figure out what's going on, you can just set a breakpoint, type dash break on the thing, boom, you're in, you're in and Bob's your uncle. Um, so, let's go on and then we'll talk about it. So, that was a quick detour into the world of customization. No, I did it again. <laughs> ah. They need to have a setting for that. It is. Let's call it Shift F5. Do -do -do. Okay, so that was customization. Azure AZ module. Azure AZ module. So, so I'm Damien Caro, and I'm actually the PM for the team that is working on, on the PowerShell modules um, for uh, Azure. So I just wanted to start with a quick recap of what we have done so far, what is the updates on, on Azure PowerShell, and what we are going to work on in the future. Um, so what we have done so far, especially in May, um, how many of you are using the Azure module with PowerShell? Just a quick poll. Okay. So if you are not aware or if you haven't been uh, aware of that, we have shipped a version 2.0 of the AZ module, which has uh, three breaking changes. One on compute. We have a few new commandlets and some have been modified. We have some changes, uh, breaking changes on AG insights. Uh, same thing for storage. So we have a um, few breaking changes on those modules, which means... If you want to use the latest updates on those modules, you would have to go to the uh, 2.2 version, which was shipped um, yesterday. Yesterday. Um, the other thing that we have been working on during the last uh, few weeks uh, in spring specifically, we have added the support for MSAL. So MSAL is the new authentication library for um, Azure Active Directory. The benefits of MSAL is that it allows you to have a single S or SSO experience. Um, so as an example, you would be able to authenticate with PowerShell and then use Visual Studio with the same authentication environment. So it's a very compelling scenario, so you don't have to re-authenticate with different uh, tools. Uh, we're using a shared token cache on the machine that is used by the, those different processes. It's still in preview. There are works that need to be still done on those, on those work, but it's a, it's a good thing to try and see how it works in your environment in case you, you're interested in this. 
Um, we also have made uh, some updates on the documentation on uh, Azure PowerShell. We've revisited the introduction. We've reworked a lot on the migration steps for those who are still using Azure RM. Any of you are still using Azure RM for whatever reasons? OK. Um, we know it's painful. We know the migration, the evolution from Azure RM to AZ is not easy for everyone. Uh, so one of the things we've been working on is to refresh the migration steps, make it easier. Um, we are very eager to hear from you if we have made a good job or if we still need to improve on those areas. Um, we are listening very carefully on all the issues you may open on GitHub. Uh, I'll come to that point in a minute. Uh, on Docs as well as on the GitHub repo for Azure PowerShell. Uh, that's my next point, actually. So all the modules that we have for Azure PowerShell are open source. The entire code is available on the repo that is listed here. Um, so not only the entire code is there, this is where we actually manage our project. This is where all the issues are tracked. This is where all the work items are tracked. We have a project where you can see actually what we're working on and what are the progress we're making on those different modules. The issues that you open over there, uh, we actually take them very carefully. We have an SLA of an initial response of two business days. So whenever you open an issue, we try to do an initial response within two days, uh, depending on holidays and weekends and stuff, uh, but we try to keep that two business day SLA. Sometimes the issue are not for the PowerShell team, but still we remain the entry point. This is what you see, this is what you're using, um, and that's the right place to put the issue. Sometimes the issue are related to what the Azure service our resource providers are doing, and in that case, we just reroute the issue to them, and they also have that engagement to actually follow up on those issues. Um, so if you have any issue, if you have any problem with the commandlets that you're using for Azure, please, please raise those issues over there. Uh, if you find some issues that are similar to use, use the thumbs up or commands. We are monitoring all of that. That helps us prioritize the work we're doing on, on, on those modules. One of the things that I really care about is your voice. I want to listen to what you have to say. I want to hear where you want us to go with the modules. So I've put a survey um, with this short link, ak.ms slash azps2019. And if you are here the next two days, I'm here until Friday early afternoon, I'm eager to have a discussion with any of you, ask what you're doing with PowerShell, how you're using it, what are your pain points, what are the things that are making your life miserable every day, but also how we can do it better, what I can do as, my, as me as a PM for Azure PowerShell, what can I do to make your life easy on a daily basis? That's my goal. That's what keeps, what keeps me up at night, how the people using PowerShell for Azure are feeling the pain. I don't want that anymore. I want to make it super easy, and I want to make PowerShell the best place to go to do Azure stuff. So fill the survey. If you're willing to talk with me in the next two days, leave your email address. I will look at that survey, respond to you with a short email, like, yep, yeah, let's meet up in the room um, next to Leibniz's room, and we'll find a time that is convenient for you. Uh, either early morning, either late in the evening, during the coffee break, whatever fits your agenda, and we'll, um, we'll, we'll identify those things. On the roadmap, what we have ahead, um, we are going to go full support for MSAL, the Microsoft Authentication Library, so we're going to go for that during uh, the next few months. And the other thing that is taking a lot of effort for the team is actually to um, introduce support for profi profiles. Uh, we are trying to go for a preview in the summer, and the value of profiles is going to remove breaking changes in the future. So for those who have gone through that migration from Azure RM to AZ, the value of profile is going to lock a certain version of APIs at one point in time, and when you run your commandlet, you can say, I want to use the profile, let's say, hybrid 2019-06. Uh, and that's going to say, 
This is the set of version of APIs that are attached to that profile. And even though your modules are evolving in time, that profile will stay, and you will still use those same API versions. So you're not having breaking changes. And you can switch, you will be able to switch profiles. So in your script, you will be able to say, hey, I'm going to use 2019.06, and then I'm going to run a script with 2019, let's say, 09, and that will be compatible. Um, as I said, we do everything on GitHub, so you can follow the evolution of this project on the Get a project and see where we, where we are on, on this. And back to Garrett. Okay. So one of the great things about the PowerShell community is that they are, it's a real community, right? There are some projects or some things that go on there where people are like, oh yeah, we like to use this, and it's nice that you've open sourced this, blah, 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 and then we hear crickets. Um, PowerShell is not like that. All the number of people that come back and go, hey, here's a fix to your command, but go ahead and fix it. I mean, wow, that's, that's dedication, the fact that people want to change things. Or they come up with a better or safer, faster, easier way of doing some of these commandlets, especially with Azure. And so we wanted to make this actually even easier for being able to con contribute fixes or scenarios or enhancements. So if you have a, you know, you have your own variant of get VM or, or create VM or whatever for one of these modules, and it's like, you just want to be able to say, here, here's my tiny little command or my variant of this, go ahead and drop that in there. Uh, and so we're, what we're doing is we're, we're making the process far more streamlined to make that happen. Because you guys don't know how to use these things a lot better than, say, the PowerShell Azure team. We don't make VMs for everything. Um, and so when you, if you want to be able to contribute back a change or something like that, you can write a command that can be in C Sharp, can be just in PowerShell. We're going to write all of our extension commands in PowerShell, and it's going to be great. Um, you still have full access to the wire level API via the generated surface. So if you want to say, I want to make this call, this call, this call, this call, this call, and turn it into one big command, let, hey, great. Power on you. Um, and then so common scenarios can be simplified and packaged along with the rest of the AZ commandlets, right? So if you make a better get VM that does something that everybody, you know, that other people want, hey, great, we can put that in there and make it easy. And at this point in time, we're looking at this going, you know, the only thing I really need from you is a PR with a single commandlet and, and maybe a test if it's actually going to do something interesting where we're going to have the pester tests in there. And, and that's it. I don't, we don't need a whole long dissertation or, you know, you're not going to have to touch a whole lot of files. You just have to provide that one commandlet and the build process will pick it up and include it in there. So that's where we're headed for that. Let's see. So in conclusion, what can we do? I want you to get auto rest, right? npm install dash g auto rest at beta. Make sure you do that at beta. You will not get it otherwise. <laughs> you get the, the stable version, which doesn't do PowerShell. Uh, and then you can do PowerShell. You can just get a module by going auto rest dash dash PowerShell dash dash input file and give it your YAML file or your JSON file. If you want to do advanced more configuration, you'll have to go and actually see how to do some of that stuff. And we've got examples in our repository. Um, and on top of that, if you want to be able to contribute to AZ PowerShell, there again is the GitHub link to the Azure PowerShell stuff. <clears throat> the stuff we're doing in the in the near term here with uh, with generation, I think it's in a branch right now called generation. So that right now, if you go there, you'll see the the current build of all the Azure commandlets. We are moving to a model where we're going to generate the vast, vast majority of code for all of the AZ commandlets and then just do scenario stuff on top of that. And we're working pretty hard to make sure that we're minimizing the amount of difference between AZ now and, and AZ then. And once we get there, um, like you said, once we start introducing profiles, those commandlet names and parameter sets and what's in there won't change. And you'll be able to just say, use this profile. And we're going to stop the we're going to stop the madness of breaking changes. <laughs> I'm not sure if everybody feels that way, but sure it seems that way for me. Um, what's our time sitting at? Look at that, 45 minutes on the nose. Sorry, it's 15 minutes of Q and A. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Okay. Well, let me uh, zip past that one. Questions? So, oh. are there any questions? Yes. Where do you get the YAML file from? Um, so in the case of Azure, we write them internally. <laughs> um, for the XKCD one, I went to, mm -hmm. I want to say API Guru or After something like that. After API Gurus. Yeah, API Goodness. Gurus, there's a website. Um, just look for, yeah, Open API. So you're basically looking for the Open API definitions. It's a forgiven yeah. resource. A lot of times you'll find these all over the place. Yeah, and, and, and they have uh, YAML for thousands of web services. Um, so you yeah. can find but if, a lot of them. If you're looking for the ones for the Azure services, just find it on our Azure GitHub stuff yeah. because those ones are much better than the ones that are in the API Guru. I don't know what they did to get some of those. They're weird. But <laughs> <laughs> they work not too bad. More questions? Yes. Uh, 
Do I know whether Azure AD PowerShell modules will get this treatment? I would say that's probably going to be farther down on the list, um, just simply because that stuff is, let's face it, a little bit uh, deeper in, in, in play. Um, and that's actually, those aren't, man, those, aren't, those aren't in the management SDK, so I don't know. If they've got Swagger, for, or if they <laughs> open API files for those, um, it's definitely a possibility. I think it depends on... I think it depends on a lot of other things, including the, uh, including the Azure AD guys themselves. I'll have to look into that one. Anything else? Yes? So what's the use case of submitting a pull request if you see that uh, Azure PowerShell modules are not the way to use it? Because if you fix them in the repository on GitHub or just try to change it, it will be overridden by what other is right? So uh, what's so the generated, so we have inside the inside the generated command inside the generated module. Let me go and show you where this is. So, oh sorry. Um, so he's talking about what is the process for when somebody submits a generated uh, command or generated or a fix to something that's in the uh, in the commandlets that we generate and stuff like that. Yeah. And, and would, would it be overwritten by the generated code? Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let me find this, um, here it is here, this resources one. So all the changes that we make on top of the, the generated code, we drop into a folder called custom. And so in this, this particular thing here, this is the source for the new AZ resources module. And so there was a handful of commandlets that we didn't generate because it wasn't based on the pattern. And so one of our devs went through and he just basically created uh, a few of these things by hand. So he went and did a, a get AZ at a, AZ AD application, Get, and he did a, looks like a couple of versions of that, a get AZ, AD group and whatnot. And so he just added these things in here. So these were pure script commandlets. And then he goes and he basically calls the thing. And I think he's adding, yeah, it looks like he's adding just a filter into the actual original commandlet and, and making the call. So if you're adding a new variant, you go and drop it in the, in the custom folder. We do not overwrite what's in the custom folder. Um, so that stuff there is specifically for extensibility purposes. That's how you can contribute. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So one file in the custom folder and boom, now you, uh, you are... Uh, Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The generate, yeah. The whole folder will have. Basically, this is the whole folder we'll check in. We won't check it. We don't even check in generated code now, which is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, we'll have the, the, the this stuff in here. Uh, and some of the other things that we put in here is that so um, we can identify. There's ways of us for identifying whether a commandlet is available in which profiles. So the profiles what we talked about. So if it's only available on certain clouds or stuff like that, we can make sure that those commandlets just show up in that particular profile. Uh, Custom. Customs. Customs and then incorporate those into the engine? No, 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 we don't have to... No, so the, the, the question I, was, do I, we the, have the goal to incorporate what comes in custom into the generated code? Right. Yeah, so we do that at build time. So we, so, so with, uh, when we do the build module step, that's when we pull in all the stuff from custom and add it to all the things that are in the, that we actually generate out. So let me add here the fact that what you're doing with a custom command let, um, well, let's, let's say we... If we wanted to do a custom commandlet back into the generated code, that means we would have to modify the API itself to be able to support what you are doing into the commandlet. That is not necessarily the case in all scenarios. So in the case the API would not be able to support that scenario or doesn't want to support that scenario, that remains a custom commandlet and that would leave that code would leave in that custom folder. Oh, if yeah, it's yeah. for overwrite or putting a workaround on the fix, um, as you rightly mentioned, then that could come as an uh, evolution of the API, and that custom commandlet would not be needed anymore. Yeah, if it's a yeah, if it's a actual uh, problem with the API, because hopefully the generator is perfect. <laughs> if the generator is not perfect, that's still just a bug, and we'd fix the generator. But yeah, uh, what else are we going to show you in here? The API modules. Oh, right. So you can look down here, and you can also see in here we have we have we generate actually for each of the the the, the for a bunch of these commandlets we can generate uh, te uh, pester test uh, skeleton code in here so that we can actually uh, eventually get full tests on all of these darn things. Um, and we also generate where is the other one? 
You have some docs and examples and stuff like that. Yeah. Oh, there's the yeah, examples. Docs. Right, so the examples. So we also have it so that it generates these files, and it only generates them if they're not there. So there's a bunch of these files that are marked that if they're already present, it won't overwrite them. So the example files are a good example. So if we want to say, I want you to show us an example. So when you generate a module and you say, oh, well, I want to add some documentation for examples, you can go and just overwrite this file or change this file here, and it won't get overwritten on the next build. Um, these files will be on GitHub. Yeah, we'll check these ones in because they're things that we want to change. So we'll generate them initially, and then we'll we'll check them in. Um, the open API files, they're on GitHub as well, actually. They're, they're in a different, yeah, well, they're in a different repo. They're in the Azure REST specs. So the, the, question REST API was, are, the question was, are the uh, open API files available on GitHub? Uh, yes, that's where Garrett is going. <laughs> Yeah. So I could create my own module. So yes. you could create your own PowerShell Azure module? Yes. Theoretically you and then do your own yeah, okay. yeah. Technically yes. I would not recommend yes. to do that. Oh yeah, absolutely. So we do have all of this stuff documented in here. So this is the Azure REST API specs repository. And in here is every open API file for every Azure RM service that there is. And so you can go in here and you can see, and we have it. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in here. Which one do you take? Uh, compute, because why, why go little? <laughs> um, and you go into compute, and you'll see every API version that we have in here as well. So we go into the stable folder. So there was one preview back in 2016. Yeah. Come on. There you go. So And you can see the different, the evolution of the uh, Azure compute module over time or the compute uh, service. And so this is all just the, the API itself. So if you look in some of these, you'll see the rather large, there we go, blah, blah, blah. So this is, you know, as you can see, this one alone is. You could create your own, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So you, if, if something comes out, so the goal in, in making most of this stuff auto-generated, of course, is so that we can shorten the amount of time from the moment that the resource provider checks this file in to the time we ship an Azure or PowerShell module. We hope to get that down to less than, you know, just a couple of days. And really, the only needed, reason it needs to be that long is because if somebody publishes something, we want to wait to see if somebody says, no, 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 don't do that. <laughs> so we want to give them a little bit of buffer time in there to, to back it out if that's not what they intended. But other than that, we want to shorten that thing to the most, the, 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 the shortest possible moment. Anything else? Any more questions? Code yes. Um, is there a container that contains auto-rest? Is there a container that contains auto-rest and? It's dependencies. And dependencies. Uh, it's out of date. I don't have one for the auto-rest PowerShell beta. No, I don't although I probably should. It basically, it'd be pretty easy to add one. Node.js 10 and uh, npm install dash g auto rest, or uh, npm, yeah, install dash g yeah. auto rest we should, data. We should, do, we should update that one. Yeah, I got a lot of things on my plate. Yeah. We'll see if we can't get that done for you. It is. It's it a is. really easy low-hanging fruit, and that's why I don't get it done. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? OK. Then we're good. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Oh, this thing kept on slipping down.